Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the Center for Latin American Studies uh, private lecture. I'm Alberto Villas Cañeros, the director of the center. Uh, today we have the lecture Fixing Capital, Broad Capitalism, Latinx, S, and the Ownership Crisis in the 20th Century in New York by Professor Pedro Regalado. Um, can we note that since this lecture is being live streamed, um, it will continue to be available to the public at our class uh, YouTube page after the event. And please, uh, if you have any questions and comments, please submit them through the YouTube chat. And I will make sure, we will make sure that we uh, read them to our speaker during the Q&A uh, part of the session. Uh, I, I do want to remind all of us uh, that here, uh, in, uh, as much as we're going to be talking about Manahata, uh, here at Stanford, uh, we are at the land and the territory of the Ohlone original peoples. Uh, we offer gratitude to the land, to the water, and to the air that surrounds us and pay our respects to the past, to the present and the future of the Ohlone original peoples uh, who continue to be present here in their homelands and also throughout their diasporas. And, and do take time if you can to learn a little bit about the original peoples in the place wherever, wherever you are. Um, professor Pedro Regalado, he's an assistant professor in history at Stanford University. He just arrived here, uh, welcome, uh, where he teaches and researches on the history of race, immigration, planning, and capitalism in Latin America. Uh, this is part of a series of things we're doing in Bolivar House to try to learn from the US perspective things that are relevant for Latin America. And we've been trying to do an effort this year to, to incorporate that into our seminar. Uh, his book, Nueva York, Making the Modern City, is a history of New York City's Latinx community during the 20th century from pioneers that arrived uh, after World War I to the panoply of Latinx people who um, uh, rebuilt the city in the wake of the 1975 fiscal crisis. Um, uh, Pedro he does not shy away from uh, uh, being a public uh, intellectual or having his uh, writing appear in places like uh, the, the uh, Washington Post uh, or the Boston Review, but he also writes uh, scholarly work, for example, in the Journal of Urban History. Um, so, before coming to Stanford, he was a um, junior fellow at the Society of Fellows at Harvard University. Pedro, welcome. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I see you're all well fed, so this bodes well for me. Um, thank you to Megan, to, who's not here, Elizabeth, and of course, Alberto for the generous invitation to share my work with you all. I've only been here for a couple of months, and so this is a really nice opportunity to just build community with you guys and to share my research. Um, thank you also to Sara for organizing all the details of, of this visit today. I'm Pedro, I'm a US historian. I'm interested in race, immigration, planning, and capitalism in US cities. And as you'll see today, I'm particularly interested in the role of the built environment and what it has to tell us about those themes. Um, today's talk is titled Fixing Capital, uh, Drug Capitalism, Latinxes, and the Ownership Crisis in Late 20th Century New York. And I'm going to spend the first few minutes saying a little bit about the book project that it's a part of to give you some context. And then I'll dive into a story focusing on New York's illicit drug trades during the 70s and 80s, particularly crack and cocaine, and how its rise in New York's different neighborhoods, but in particular parts of the Bronx and Washington Heights, intersected with the contradictory role of housing as, as both a form of investment um, and also shelter. Keep in mind that this is definitely work in progress. I'm really glad that we have many students here today to push me in different directions. So whatever feedback you have to offer me is something that I'll meditate over and I'll be able to incorporate as I work on this manuscript. Um, the book project that this is a part of is called Nueva York, Making the Modern City, which tracks the development of New York's Latinx community throughout the 20th century and demonstrates how the history of the city during this period in large part became the history of Latinx placemaking and the economy. The project starts in the first densely populated neighborhoods, um, Latinx neighborhoods in the city, particularly downtown Brooklyn, the Columbus Street waterfront, and East Harlem, and it follows the evolution of the community throughout the different changes in New York's political economy, from the New Deal to urban renewal to post-war um, deindustrialization. And my goal is really to think through how various elements of the community with respect to race, class, and nationality experience the city, 
but also in turn reshape its politics, its economy, and its culture. At bottom, the project is based and rooted in explaining this enormous demographic transition that we see throughout the 20th century. In 1920, Latinx New Yorkers uh, numbered roughly 41,000 according to census statistics, as far short of even 1% um, of the population. And by the end of the century, uh, they were 2.1 million. I believe in the last census, they were 2.5. That's about a third of the city's population. And truly one of the most dramatic demographic shifts in modern uh, US urban history. And this project is really the first um, uh, uh, extended account of this change. It's an ambitious story to be sure, but one that I hope will offer a new narrative for the history of New York during the 20th century and offer meaning to this uh, uh, dramatic shift that we see. And also one that'll help historians think more clearly about the relationship between Latinx Americans and U.S. cities, which for far too long has been seen through the lens of, of decline um, and in a way that doesn't quite account for the complexities or nuances of Latinx life in the city. So all of this is really important context for what we're about to dive into and a really good segue into our story. So in December 1986, Santiago Luis Polanco Rodriguez held a Christmas party for his employees. Over 100 guests danced and ate at a social club in Washington Heights. In their minds, they had good reason to be cheerful. Their uh, organization generated the largest crack operation in New York City, raking in roughly $36 million a year. That's roughly $100 million today. Um, but collapse loomed around the corner. The following summer, DEA agents raided Polanco Rodriguez's headquarters uh, in the Bronx, and they found um, bulletproof vests, automatic weapons, and over 100,000 empty crack files. The indictment that brought them there that day included 29 defendants headed by Polanco Rodriguez, uh, who were charged with conspiracy to distribute crack and cocaine, criminal enterprise, racketeering, money laundering, and using firearms. Officials held that the 26-year-old enterprise distributed as many as 10,000 vials of crack a day, which is workers sold between 10 and $20. The young man eluded agents during the, the raid. He moved to the Dominican Republic where this picture was taken some 10 years later, and we'll, uh, we'll return to this a little bit uh, later. And, through, and, and officials believe that he started selling cocaine as a teenager. And around 1982, when he was 20 or 21 years old, um, he really started to expand his operation. By 1985, uh, his business was really uh, uh, established in crack and made one of him one of the wealthiest drug traffickers in the United States. In many ways, his entrepreneurial acumen was equal to that of Latinx bankers and business people like Ricardo Carrion Jr. and Johnny Torres. Ricardo Carrion is the gentleman pictured on the right with his arms crossed. He was the president of Banco Popular, which beginning in 1961 started operating in New York City, spread its operations across the country and became the largest Latinx bank. And the gentleman standing right behind Nixon as he signs the Office of Minority Business Enterprise Act into law is Johnny Torres, whose business in the 1980s was one of the top 25 Latinx businesses in the country. And he essentially was the bodeguero, uh, his warehouse was the bodega of the bodegas. So in the 1980s, the uh, thousands of bodegas in the city really got their products from Johnny Torres. These are individuals that I speak about elsewhere in the book who sought to glean opportun the opportunity to generate profit in New York's built environment and the social context that surrounded that built environment. Obviously, Barranco Rodriguez's uh, uh, was an illicit enterprise, but nonetheless, the organization and networks that he developed transformed the nature of the city's illicit drug industries and the way that Latinx and other communities related to it. I should note that his case was notable not only because of its scale and sophistication, but also because crack had appeared in New York just a few decades, a few uh, years prior to his arrest. During the 1960s, cocaine was really um, a drug for wealthy club owners and uh, club goers in New York. By the 1970s, as Latin American and Caribbean capitalists uh, began to import the drug into the US, it became much more affordable. But in 1983, there was an immense uh, uh, drop in the value of cocaine, which made it such that um, crack offered new opportunities for developing an affordable and mass market drug. Um, workers used baking soda to free the hydrochloric acid 
um, from the powder cocaine, purifying it to its base form. Uh, users smoked the drug, which was a small rock that was usually white, gray, or beige, as you see here, which was many times stronger than cocaine. Polanco Rodriguez applied an organizational structure within the crack industry with high levels of risk, becoming what one DEA agent stated, quote, uh, he was the man who started marketing crack as we know it. The sellers offered discounts on weekends, they distributed business cards, and they branded their drug. One of their brands was Based Balls, which refers both to the process of creating the drug, the basing method, and also baseball, the cherished Dominican pastime. Mm -hmm. But let's zoom out for a moment. The violence and incarceration that the illicit drug distribution and consumption uh, generated during the 20th century has become part of a very familiar story among US historians. In New York, Nelson, uh, Governor Nelson Rockefeller, pictured here in the bottom, uh, enacted severe punitive measures during the 1970s that included life um, sentences for drug workers, for violent crimes committed by addicts. Um, he removed youthful protect protection programs and uh, uh, also offered payment for information on drug workers and their activities. These policies presaged Richard Nixon's uh, war on drugs, which he stated, quote, was one of the most vicious and corrosive forces attacking the foundations of American society. And by 1977, more than 20 federal agencies were involved in curtailing uh, the drug trade, and oftentimes, or in some cases at least, with community support. By the 1980s, this uh, law and order political culture grew into a national panic with the introduction of crack into the drug market, again, in the mid-1980s. Urban Black, American, and Latinx involvement in the industry became shorthand evidence of their criminality and resulted in the vast incarceration that today we know as mass incarceration. Um, for all its explanatory power, this story fails to account for the actual contours of drug capitalism itself, as well as the local, national, and global forces that gave rise uh, uh, or that kindled its success. As I hope to demonstrate for many Latinxes suffering from severe poverty, neighborhood segregation, um, the ability to tap into this and other locally based economies restructured their relationship, the relationship between work and residence. Across the city, deteriorating multi-unit buildings, particularly old and new law tenement buildings that we'll talk about today, attracted a cross-section of aspiring capitalists um, who observed the advantages of appropriating residential buildings. So in basements, garment workers toiled over sewing machines, and this is, imagine a six-story building. At ground floor, bodegueros supplied their neighborhoods with culturally familiar products, and like their counterparts below, drug workers began to set up shop in the hallways, staircases, fire escapes, and rooftops of buildings. Indeed, the unprofitability of once profitable real estate priority created an opening for an underground or rather indoors economy um, surrounded uh, or organized around illicit drugs. And what I want to focus on is that beyond the commercial prowess that many contemporaneous accounts of Polanco Rodriguez emphasized during the 1980s, the young man's quote unquote success was made possible by particular features of his social context. Rather than the story of one capitalist, I want to think about how someone situated in the particular space that Polanco Rodriguez was embedded in, engaged with the social history of that space. And to understand that, let's turn to the built environment that they used and how that became useful to them. So at the turn of the 20th century, ethnic landlords responded to New York's growing Im immigrant communities by erecting a flurry of dense housing structures. To do so, they observed the guidelines of the Tenement House Law of 1901, which legislated um, better standards in sanitation, in lighting and in safety than previous residential buildings. It also made it such that buildings couldn't be more than six stories, uh, particularly these residential buildings. Um, so here is uh, just a photo from Google Maps from a few years ago of one block of new law buildings in Washington Heights. So you notice again, six stories. Um, in the middle, you have the courtyard for trash. Here you have, in, in the middle of the buildings, you have some space for lighting. So every apartment has some lighting. And so these were really innovations at the turn of the century that uh, were, was a compromise between people being able to live safely in cities and landlords seeking to generate wealth by really uh, maximizing space, right? 
Over the next three decades, the city's neighborhoods became crowded with clusters of these so-called new law buildings as, as if copied and pasted block by block. By 1964, old and new law buildings totaled 1.2 million units in the city, or 64% of the city's multi-family housing. Um, but their fortunes turned for the worst, beginning in the 1960s, when abandonment undermined their ability to house the city's middle classes. Moreover, in the city emerging from a near bankruptcy in 1975, landlords believed that updating heating, fixing elevators, maintaining plumbing, required a level of investment that diminished their revenue, especially when they were not able to raise rents. Alberta and I were speaking earlier about how in Washington Heights, uh, or particularly Washington Heights in particular, was uh, is a haven for rent control departments. And so this is one of the big battles that you see between landlords and tenants between the 60s and 80s. Um, for Gilbert Ankowitz, doing so, making these repairs, would have really uh, defeated the purpose of his venture, which was to buy a building, uh, uh, buy it cheap, and turn a profit. This is an interview with him that's part of the uh, uh, Tamament Library and uh, Robert F. Wagner Labor Archives at NYU. This is one of dozens of interviews with landlords that give us a sense of um, what they're thinking and also just the statistics of how many buildings they own. And so in 1977, Gilbert Ankowitz owned between 25 and 30 buildings across Manhattan, mostly in the Upper West Side. 80% of them were residential or more than 50 years old. In building talk, that means that they were middle age, which means that they really needed overhaul in, again, um, plumbing, um, facade pictures, and many other uh, pieces that would make the, the, the building habitable. Um, in one building on the border of Harlem and Washington Heights, tenants complained to Anglitz that they lived without heat or hot water. And when they threatened the rent strike, he essentially told them, do you know what the price of fuel is. He was referencing the 1974 oil embargo. So again, in many ways, we start to see how the local is global and how these coalesce in the kind of social context um, that many drug workers end up engaging with. So New York's private housing stock by the 1970s, again, a mix of old and new law buildings reached a point of crisis by the 1970s. On one hand, a landlord class that initially intensified use of space to generate wealth and then withdrew services during the 1970s to maximize their dwindling profits, faced insolvency, a tenants movement uh, that looked to enforce housing quality and prohibit speculative profits um, was weakened by the flight of hundreds of thousands of tenants from these buildings. So between 1970 and 1980, you have uh, nearly a million New Yorkers leaving the city to the suburbs, right? So if any kind of organizing uh, or, or political power and uh, voting block that you're trying to generate is really diminished by the fact that so many people are leaving the city. And finally, city leaders like John Lindsay, whose urban renewal strategies um, had failed to generate the tax windfall that city planners and politicians hoped, attempted to restore the economic incentive in private ownership of housing with condo conversions and other uh, uh, methods without developing a comprehensive strategy that would ensure the preservation of housing whether or not the profit motive was satisfied, right? Um, I say more about the role of banks and insurers in the book, but what we see is, the is that the reality of neighborhood and building transition generated a crisis over what it meant to own and belong in New York's buildings. Of course, this is arguably a feature of housing uh, uh, since the, the 1500s, of course, the tension between housing as investment and shelter and something that we're certainly seeing today with skyrocketing prices um, but in a city where millions of apartment units towed the line between residence, profit, and fiscal insolvency, this crisis was unique in how it altered the relationship between poor immigrant residents and the thousands of buildings that they inherited during the 60s, 70s, and 80s. For many Latinxes across the city and for the Dominicans that I'm going to talk about today, Dominican immigrants <coughs> like Yeo, who gleaned a financial lifeline in a resurging illicit drug industry, this meant adapting buildings from places of residence to ones of work. So let's return to Yayo. This is a picture um, that was captured in 1996, about uh, roughly a decade after uh, the agents raided his headquarters. As you see, this isn't quite the typical picture that we see in the media of drug workers, certainly not in the 1980s and 1990s. 
And uh, this was on purpose. So a New York Times reporter went down to the Dominican Republic. Uh, uh, Yayo, as he was called, really wanted to show that he had turned a new leaf, um, that he was a family man. And this was really in the context of extradition um, uh, uh, deals that were going on between the Dominican Republic and the mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani, not the president, over whether to extradite many of these legal officials. The NYPD even uh, tried to negotiate a NYPD uh, precinct in Santo Domingo, the capital of the Dominican Republic. Really an extraordinary story. And so Bolanco Rodriguez saw the writing on the wall and really wanted to say, hey, I can be useful to you, Giuliani. I can be someone uh, that tells the kids stay away from drugs. Um, Yayo was born in the Dominican Republic in 1961, which is a really momentous year. On the one hand, it was the end of a um, three-decade-long dec dictatorship with Rafael Trujillo. And on the other hand, it was the beginning of a mass migration away from the island, and particularly to New York City. So in, early, in the early 1960s, New York was home to like a couple thousand Dominicans. <coughs> Statistics are a little fuzzy. And uh, today there are 800,000. So there are as many Dominicans in New York City as there are people in San Francisco, more than there are people in Seattle. I mean, it's really a mass migration. And uh, Polanco Rodriguez and his family migrated to Washington Heights, which was really um, the hub of this diaspora for many, many years. Um, he attended George Washington High School in the neighborhood, spent much, much of his time boxing before dropping out both as a teenager and dedicating his time to the drug trade. And he eventually recruited widely among neighborhood gangs um, in Washington Heights, also the Bronx and Flatbush in Brooklyn. In building his enterprise, Polanco Rodriguez turned his attention to the very buildings that landlords like Gilbert Ankowitz struggled to squeeze revenue Rather than battling landlords over rent or repairs in the way that the tenants movement was doing, drug capitalists and workers adapted buildings into points of production, distribution, and organizational administration. Polanco Rodriguez started doing this around 1982 when he quote unquote bought a street corner from a competitor. According to authorities, he teamed up with another former boxer and paid that entrepreneur $40,000 for the right to sell a uh, uh, illicit drugs in 526 West 173rd Street. Um, this is Washington Heights, the neighborhood where I grew up. Um, this is the East River. It's a really narrow and dense neighborhood. Um, so the, the last street that you see before the pool, in fact, uh, this is the pool in, in the Heights, Elizabeth, that we were talking about. That's High Bridge, where I, where I tried to learn to swim. I just you, saw that film. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's the pool where, where it was at. And so you can walk actually from Amsterdam, which is that last street, all the way to the Hudson River in a matter of 20 minutes. It's quite dense, quite narrow. And another, something that I don't speak about here, um, this is the, the FDR. On the other side is the Henry Hudson Highway. You have the George Washington Bridge. And so in many ways, it's also like a perfect place to generate a, a tri-state enterprise because you have routes to New Jersey, you have routes to Connecticut. So in this way, um, Part of what I'm trying to do today is think about the building itself as that structure, but then also the neighborhood is also a, a very important unit of analysis. The building that he bought, um, so uh, so-called bought, was built in 1906. It was a new law tenement in the same way you notice uh, from the previous photograph. Um, and I'm working on trying to figure out what the value of that building was on the lawful market that year to know whether or not Blanco Rodriguez paid more than the building was worth uh, in its actual real estate value. Of course, he was not taxed on his property in the traditional sense, um, nor was he forced to uh, contend with tenant complaints in the same way that landlords were, at least not yet, something we start to see in the late 80s. But any legal rights to the space were obviously absent and where landlords feared inspectors as the foot soldiers of the Department of Buildings, um, the DEA agents who raided Polanco's headquarters were essentially the tax, they were the harbingers of fiscal insolvency. In any case, Polanco Rodriguez's uh, initial investment of $40,000 paid off quite handsomely, and he spread his uh, enterprises across multiple buildings that contained thousands of units. He trained his workers to set up apartments for production, sale, and security. So he would equip uh, uh, front doors with um, steel, with small holes in ways that would um, essentially protect against aggressive competitors and police. Uh, but that also allowed for the rapid and anonymous exchange of money and drugs. Behind closed doors in these buildings, workers processed cocaine, which some packed 
um, and divided while others repackaged into a, a small pyramid of papers or aluminum foil in small quantities. In crack-centered operations beginning in the mid-1980s, um, some workers used the kitchen essentially as laboratories while others in the living room, again, packed them into small vials. Um, and others sold those vials and building entrances, block corners, and parks. The production and distribution process was facilitated by the work of many kinds of roles, theorists, touts, lookouts, um, transporters, who wielded their knowledge of spaces that they knew. Again, these were their residences. They knew their neighborhood. They were extremely familiar with new law buildings. Um, and they exchanged them uh, uh, for money. Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just about how many families would normally live in a building like that? Uh, like 96 units. Okay. So really uh, intense. So if you look at like one census tract, which is like maybe in, in Washington Heights, maybe two to three blocks by three to four blocks, that's over 10,000 people. It's really oh, extremely very, very dense. 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 Um, and, and, that, and that density actually comes up in a moment in a very important way. Um, but to speak about the, the scale of drugs, uh, drug capitalism in industrial and commercial uh, location and housing was extremely immense. And people started to pay attention to this in the 1980s. In 1988, 60% of more than 7,000 drug related prosecutions occurred in or in front of a building. Again, uh, uh, more than 60% of 7,000 drug related prosecutions. Uh, occurred in or in front of the building. Unbelievable statistic. This report also found that between 646 and 791 buildings containing almost 40,000 apartments were involved in the drug trade. Again, another unbelievable statistic that they found. This really points to the ubiquity of New York's illicit drug trades. Um, that made it an important but unacknowledged element of New York's post-industrial economy. So again, if we zoom out for a moment, when we think about the story of post for New York, it's typically one from manufacturing, the decline of manufacturing towards service work, stratified service work with fire, insurance, and real estate at the top of the ladder and low income uh, uh, service workers at the bottom, right? But we don't quite grapple with the drug industry for, for a flurry of reasons, but Doing so, I think, might help us to, to, to offer a more accurate picture of what New York's post-industrial economy actually looked like. Um, its scale also meant that these dense collection of buildings, like any point of labor, uh, were incubators of popular culture and politics. And here's a little aside on Latinidad. The diversification of drug workers and entrepreneurs in the 1970s, so early on, just to backtrack, between the 20s and the 60s, the heroin trade was really controlled by Italian um, and, and Jewish entrepreneurs, capitalists, and workers. And in the 1970s, like I mentioned earlier, the importation of cocaine um, by folks from the Caribbean and Latin America uh, really dropped this price. And you see a diversification of workers. Um, but did this, this did not dislodge the ethnic and racial segmentation that was endemic to organized crime for over a century. So the hierarchy of sale was organized into ethnic niches. And for Latinxes, this determined where uh, national groups sat in its uh, uh, structure. So Colombian importers prefer doing business with Dominican salespeople, right? So it's not, we're trying to disaggregate a little bit here. Um, and as one Dominican worker, Splib, who was featured in Terry Williams's unbelievable ethnography called The Cocaine Kids in the 1980s, this Dominican drug worker stated, quote, the Colombians have so much coke, they can't sell it without finding new markets. Blacks have proven that they can organize and sell the shit, excuse me, but the Colombians don't know how to deal with black guys. They don't understand their world or the way they do business, and I do, and they know it. For his Colombian suppliers, Spanish language and cultural affiliation was Split's mark of reliability. For his Black American counterparts down in Harlem, Split's proximity to and association with Black American working class culture also offer the opportunity to collaborate, right? So again, we see how race and ethnicity are central to the ability to even generate any kind of wealth or any kind of job in the industry during this period. To many of his peers, Polanco Rodriguez's creative mastery of the built environment demonstrated how he, for them, embodied the American dream. A Dominican 20-year-old riding down the, Grand Con the Bronx's Grand Concourse in a gold Mercedes, um, he really rejected the restrained labor options that the city's economy offered men like him. 
He unlocked the social possibilities of buildings that his generation felt confined to, and he embraced the street culture that individuals like Split really admired. And he was the source of such admiration by the 1980s that cocaine itself, even to this day, you might hear uh, uh, referred to as Yeo, which is the American pronunciation of Yeo. In the process, he showed how capitalizing on space could also be a collectivizing force. And this is something that I'm working through <coughs> in the chapter and the manuscript. No language is more direct than the use of affiliation with the city block, a space of financial and social possibility, which trumped identification with the youth gangs of an earlier period. So if you read Eric Schneider's amazing work um, on youth gangs, you notice that between the 20s and the 60s, one of the biggest issues facing politicians, parents, and teachers was the rise of youth gangs with names like the Egyptians, the, the dragons, um, uh, all of these names, the warriors, maybe more, most famously in the movie. By the 70s and 80s, you don't see that as much anymore. And instead, you see an affiliation with one's block. And, and certain feuds that occur between blocks. And in some interviews, I found that certain individuals in Washington Heights in particular, and I would say that this was certainly the case when I was growing up, uh, identified so much with their block that going to another block was going to another territory. And that block might've been three minutes um, away from their home. Of course, success on one's block depended on where one sat in drug capitalism's hierarchy. For Bolanco Rodriguez at the top of the uh, organization, the vulnerability to death terror and grief that his workers experienced made him a fortune. This is also how he made his money. So I don't want to keep the, the focus on the space as the only way in which he made money. He's also making money from the suffering and, and really the work of, of the people who were in his organization. Um, moreover, that buildings doubled as residence and workplace, we can't forget that people still live in these spaces, meant that housing was not the merely physical, but a social infrastructure that drug workers had to engage with. Here in 1055 University Avenue, a building that I talk a little bit more about in the chapter, workers evaded eviction by using their profits to illegally sublet apartments from other tenants for as much as $3,000 a month. I mean, an incredible number for people who in this census tract were making about $9,000 a year living below the poverty line. Um, according to this building's managing agent, Many were also friendly with drug workers uh, and took small loans from them. At the same time, tenants also posed a tremendous threat to operations. Drug workers' use of space was at odds with the uh, 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 use of space was at odds with the fact that people again lived in these spaces. Now, whereas Colombian importers were compelled to their, resolve their issue of oversupply by equipping a greater diversity of upstarts. So the fact that they had so much cocaine meant that they just couldn't sell to Dominicans to sell it. They also did so with African-Americans who initially they didn't want to, right? Um, in the same way, local drug worker success in meeting consistent demand required what? A greater use of spatial resources, right? And this generated a greater degree of violence. Crime rates have finally started to decline in New York City around 1982 for the first time in 20 years. And beginning in 1985, you see a striking level of violence associated with intense competition for market share, heavily armed young people, um, and users searching for ways to access the drug. This spatial fix, as it were, in Marx's term, on the part of drug capitalists employing a greater number of buildings and thus resulted in a greater scale of violence that accompanied production and distribution. Right? Across New York, parents, parishioners, um, and everyday residents held drug workers responsible for wreaking havoc on their buildings and thereby threatening their ability to leave healthy and safe lives. In the mid 1980s, uh, groups like the Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition, a mouthful, um, grew to a movement of an estimated 10,000 people, quite diverse um, in its membership, who demanded greater police presence, harsher pr prison sentences for repeat offenders in drug related cases but also education that would prevent new users and sellers. At the heart of the clergy's coalition's activism was the notion that drug workers controlled buildings, leading not only to violence, but also physical neglect and abandonment. It was not surprising that their critique was rooted in space because they had spent, the clergy coalition had spent much of its time up to 1983 focusing on revitalizing buildings and its associational members included community-based groups like Bronx 2000, who conducted the study earlier, 
who relied on a mix of public and private funds to gut and rehab buildings in their neighborhoods. So the drug industry was at odds. It undermined such work. It undermined the vanguard of a new urban development that we see in New York and in cities across the country. In the post-war moment, the state was <coughs> quite involved in investing, um, for better or worse, in housing. And by the 70s and 80s, an era that US historians consider an era of retrenchment in US cities, many grassroots groups are left to uh, rely upon these public and private partnerships that you really start to see. In fact, this is what prompted again Bronx 2000 to study how drug offenses replace unpaid taxes and code violations as indicators of buildings at risk of abandonment. So here, um, tenants who are once deprived city halls in action over declining housing quality driven by landlord speculation turned their attention to drug workers whose tactics likewise generated inhabitability. One of the clergy coalition's members who formed its committee on fighting drugs boldly pronounced, as you see here, we're not going, so they have to. Residents had initially been a little suspicious of City Hall. They felt that uh, police officers were being placed in the Lower East Side and Washington Heights because those were areas of political visibility. Um, but they slowly but surely encountered a City Hall that became their ally. The clergy coalition eventually worked with local precincts to assist them in surveilling uh, area streets, buildings, and drug transactions, locations, um, even designated uh, uh, DEA agent Robert Stutman um, to its drug out task force. And for me, this is what's really interesting, that when viewed from the perspective of space, the drug trade seems less this fantastical uh, 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 story in history and instead part of a broader history, maybe perhaps a bit more boring of urban redevelopment, and in particular, the crisis in New York's buildings that they all uh, uh, utilize. And one of the big takeaways is that situating them in that history helps to dislodge drug workers as the kind of powerful disease that they were portrayed as in the 1980s. By the late 1980s, drug workers became the disproportionate focus in explaining the decline in New York's buildings. They were responsible, they were urban marauders. Um, in the process, such explanations constrained remedies that would have addressed the multi-layered ownership crisis that drug work simply inflamed and which supplied the space necessary to make that industry boom. Again, ruin had begun to materialize way before drug workers arrived. It was part of a very long process. They simply took advantage, to it, uh, advantage of it, excuse me. To be sure, they did so in ways that were destructive to many lives. And so the goal isn't to get them off the hook, but to really understand their practices more fully and understand, again, the social context um, that gave rise to these um, um, activities. To conclude, I just want to point to how this relates to the national picture. During the 1980s, Ronald Reagan signed a series of bills that accelerated police militarization and the vilification of social welfare programs. This is a part of the story that US historians are starting to fill out a bit more clearly. But his administration also developed new space-centered laws. Um, in particular, the 1986 Anti-Drug Abuse Act possessed a statute that, quote, made maintaining or making available any place for the purpose of manufacturing, distributing, or using a controlled substance, a federal crime, and violating this decree will result in a maximum uh, a penalty of 20 years in prison and a fine of $500,000. This had uh, an immediate impact in New York City, where US Attorney Rudy Giuliani, Reagan's first while um, Associate Attorney General, wielded the policy when uh, indicting and prosecuting Rodriguez and his co-conspirators, uh, particularly his sister and his mother, who counted cash in the operation, but also leased out the different apartments for the operation. Right? So the state is looking much more forcefully at space in ways that it had in the past. Ultimately, this is the other major takeaway, um, which is uh, the need to balance the history of drug regulation, i.e. the war on drugs literature that's emerging and really flourishing so well, with the history of the drug trade itself, if we're going to understand its roots and its consequences. Um, thank you guys so much, and I'm really looking forward to questions. Do we have questions here on the table? Yeah. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, 
So we've kind of been looking, I uh, think this all pretty really interesting. Uh, we've been looking at um, gangs in, in Rio mm. and, and kind of looking at the margins of the state, where the state fails and where the gangs kind of take over mm. some of the functions of the state, right? Yeah. So I was wondering, you know, so they kind of was mostly about kind of justice, you know, and taking kind of having these sort of courts, if you like. Um, I was wondering if, if there was kind of examples of that you said about them loading out. Yeah, cash. that's exactly what it was yeah. Interesting. No, that's a that's a really great question, and exactly why I was really excited to present to the Latin Americans because I think, whereas the U.S. historians are focused mostly on the regulation side and the war on drugs side, we're just starting to get at the trade itself and the way it functions. Um, I feel like that literature among Latin Americans is actually pretty well developed. So thanks for that great question. Um, I think maybe two two examples of the way that they kind of intervene, not only in the uh, state functions, but in other functions as well. So I think those the loans are a really, really important piece of that. Um, again, if we look at one of the census tracts uh, where 1055 is, the average income is something like $9,000 a year. So $3,000 uh, for, for uh, subletting an apartment is an incredible sum. And on top of that, the ability to, to have loans when particular banks are redlining those neighborhoods is a huge um, opportunity, but the interest on these loans is also absurd, right? So kind of like loan sharks, essentially, where the interest rate goes up every week. Um, again, in the same ways, they weren't innovators in this. They were just taking stuff from um, different criminal organizations in the city. But that, those are two ways you see it. And I'll also say um, the piece about generating a sense of belonging in that space is also really important. Of course, the violence cannot be ignored. The crime rates in the 1980s were insane. Um, but something that's also really important to recognize is that individuals like Splib really idolized these guys, right? And, and I think it's important to differentiate between the different levels in the organization. Most folks never saw Yale's face, right? Like, except when he had his Christmas party, you see your boss, the CEO, finally. Um, but for many people in these different neighborhoods in their blocks, these were kind of role models of people who were doing, making do with what they understood was an unjust system, the space that they really felt that they were confined to, and in some cases were. Um, and so I think that's another kind of, whereas there are certain functions of the state and banks, um, et cetera, there's a particular function that these individuals use, and this is quite polemic, that make them community leaders in some respects, right? And in the literature, we don't see that. The community leaders are always the Northwest Bronx Clergy Coalition. But in this case, maybe we can start to think about how they related to other young people. Right? And the question of women is something that I think is a little bit different with regard to, again, that kind of mentorship for all that. Um, that we see particularly about uh, among young men in the neighborhood. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. That was such a wonderful talk. Um, and to that point, I was wondering, so you mentioned that there were, this, these were spaces like labor and residents. And I was wondering like, yeah. how, what was the kind of, what were the numbers and like how many people were um, kind of working in this trade and living yeah. in, the, in the apartments? And then for the people who weren't um, like directly involved, um, in the trade, but still occupied those spaces? Like, what was the relationship between, um, kind of, I guess, those two sides? Yeah. You know, what's really interesting about when, when, when we'll call him Yayo for now, when Yayo comes in, part of what he does is really consolidate a wild west of mom and pop businesses. If you and I wanted to get into the crack business in the 1980s, it wouldn't be that hard. We'd get a, a cocaine supplier, and then we can kind of stretch whatever we get. And, um, uh, adulterate that, that product in a way that makes as much kind of crack rock as possible to, in, in the crudest sense. Um, so early on before that, anybody could really get into it. And so you might have people who already lived. And so in, in, in Yayo's case, they're taking over a lot of apartments. Part of what uh, uh, this is grounded in is the abandonment that we start to see in the 60s and 70s. But it's also the case that people started doing it in their homes, in their own kitchens, right? Um, so it's hard to put a number on, on the scale of it. I think that's where ethnography is so incredibly useful. Uh, uh, Terry Williams's book, The Cocaine Kids, he follows these five teenagers. And they were teenagers because the Rockefeller laws that I mentioned earlier made it <coughs> such that uh, you had to be like 17 or 18, I forget the exact year, to get some of these penalties. So a lot of people like Polanco Rodriguez just hired 12 year olds and 13 year olds who they knew wouldn't get um, those kind of sentences. He follows these teenagers and you get the sense of the, uh, and this isn't a focus of the book, but you get the sense of the kind of built environment that they're engaging in, right? Like one is in somebody's uh, uh, mom's apartment, et cetera. And so it's just really difficult to get a sense of the scale. 
That's why I think that Bronx 2000 um, report is so useful. It's, it's tough to say the extent to which um, it's that accurate. They're using district attorney records. And so it's, it's useful, but they also have an agenda, which is to show, replace again, tax arrears, et cetera, that led to landlord um, abandonment and replacing that with like drug work as a kind of like, it's not just violence, but now your building's gonna decay somehow because drug workers are there. Um, so that's kind of to answer that question of um, the scale of the industry. Is, is that answer? Yeah. Yeah, here and then. There's, there's this quote by Garcia Marquez that I have to think of. I'll paraphrase it because I can't remember his part, but he says something along the lines of, we know that in order to take a kilo of, of cocaine from the highlands of Bolivia where it's grown to the US-Mexico border, it requires a level of corruption so high that it gets mm -hmm. to the presidencies of every country. Right. And yet, when it comes to the United States, we have no idea of how much corruption it is required to do this. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could speak a little more about mm -hmm. the interaction of these drug lords with formal authorities, because I think oftentimes when we talk yeah. about the US, everything becomes about saints and great policemen fighting drug cartels, whereas in Latin America, we know of the high existence of levels of corruption. Absolutely. I mean, I think this is where the, the police precincts come in, particularly uh, 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 the 34th precinct in Washington Heights, which, uh, as I've written about elsewhere, was the focus of a federal investigation where they were just taking drugs from folks. And um, when uh, there was an uprising in the neighborhood in 1992, and you can find this on YouTube, many of the people, young people who are like some of which are likely drug workers, are telling to whoever is recording them, like, these cops are taking our stuff, right? Um, and so there's an immense level of corruption here. And uh, I'll say if, if I was writing a whole book on the drug trade, that would certainly be itself a couple of chapters. But here I kind of truncate my, my focus to the built environment and engagements with it. But I'll say, one, the cops are extremely corrupt um, in a lot of cases. And then also the case of the banks. In the late uh, 80s and early 90s, you have all these congressional hearings with bankers um, who are uh, uh, upset with the federal government and with state governments for enacting many uh, laws that make it such that you can only uh, deposit a certain amount of money, you can only hold a certain amount of money because they're seen as places that are kind of washing it in a sense or, or holding money that's washed in local businesses and boleras and so on and so forth. Um, and, I, and I believe right on 178th Street in St. Nicholas, there was one bank that was closed down because when they went to do an investigation, there was just $2 million lying in a vault that was unaccounted for. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very difficult to, to overemphasize the extent to which the drug trade really penetrated all of these different elements of social life, right? From cops to banks to small businesses. I think one of the big issues that we see is that during the 1980s, individuals like Robert Jackal and other journalists really play that up in a way that then criminalizes everybody in the neighborhood, right? So it's like a thin line of trying to understand the vastness of the trade and the way that it engages with the social context, while at the same time not, uh, I guess, creating these stereotypes of everyone in the neighborhood as engaged in that trade. Yeah. Um, so I guess I have more of a contemporary question, yeah. but so I have family that lives in Washington oh, nice. and I was staying with my aunt this summer okay. and we were wandering around and she was talking to me about gentrification mm. um, and how a lot of people now are currently being pushed towards the Bronx. Yeah. Um, and so I guess my question is just like, how does the image, like what you were saying of yeah. drug dealers as a disease and how that relates to race and ethnicity, how, how is that impactful in the like, current gentrification? Yeah. Process? I mean, so so two things. Something that we mentioned earlier that I, I actually I think I, I I noticed you acknowledge is that the rent control in the neighborhood is actually quite incredible, and so it stymies gentrification in a way that you don't see. I think in maybe any other neighborhood in New York City, maybe Jackson Heights. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that context. Maybe not. Um, but the other thing that I was going to say is something that um, I'm trying to develop in this chapter is to show the way in which. Uh, particularly grassroots groups in the 80s who are revitalizing space with, again, a mix of like funds from the city, from the state, but also from insurance companies like Aetna, multi-billion dollar uh, corporations, essentially. In an earlier moment, they were really, uh, they were antagonistic toward the city. And by the 80s, it's almost as if the city and many of these grassroots groups find a common enemy. It's sort of like your uh, enemy is my enemy, now we're friends. 
And so there's a, I don't wanna draw a direct line and I'm really working on trying to understand the mechanics of it, but there's a particular way in which many of these grassroots groups kind of clear the land for a lot of the gentrification that you see less in Washington Heights and yeah. more in the Bronx. Yeah. Um, Cause again, I think the reliance, and this is something that's broader to the last 50 years in urban redevelopment is that you see the shift away from state funding, immense state funding for urban renewal projects and more toward these kind of public private um, relationships wherein the private element of it has a particular incentive, right? In the same way that the landlords did. It's like, let's clear this land, let's build higher, let's rezone. And so I think that it's not a good answer to your question, but that's kind of where my head is at in terms of trying to figure it out. I'm certainly thinking about the same thing. We have a question from uh, Aaron Ramirez. Yeah. Thanks for this insightful and exciting presentation, Professor Regalado. Do you see a relation between informal work and the city's tax base? Your chapter on Banco Popular uh, has shown how uh, Latinx specific entrepreneurship generated personal revenues, but also tax revenues, um, yeah. because it revitalized community economies. I'm wondering if you see something similar here whether because informal economies had some direct impact on the tax base, uh, perhaps through uh, effects of real estate, on real estate, or indirectly, perhaps uh, through some impact on subsidiary formal economies rising in tandem with informal work. Yeah. Thanks again for your great presentation. Yeah, I mean, those are such solid questions. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start with the tax revenue piece as it relates to revitalization. I think some of the most exciting work coming out of Black Bank's history is done by folks like Andrew Sandoval Strauss, Lana Barber, who are showing um, the way in which uh, Latinx immigration and by proxy other forms of immigrant immigration to uh, uh, declining cities really saves them insofar as they're reinvigorating the tax base, right? Like the, the tax receipts, which is really important. Um, you see the same thing in, in New York to a certain extent, um, but I want to temper kind of the revitalizing piece in so far as it's revitalizing the tax base, but these folks, most of them are, or not most of them, but a great uh, number of them are living below the poverty line, right? So I think for me, that's kind of where um, I'm trying to figure out how to intervene in the conversation of tax revenues, revitalization, revitalization for who exactly, in a sense, right? Um, the informal work piece, I mean, it's interesting because again, Bronx 2000 believed that um, they were gutting the tax base. I think the statistic for them was something like the, the 640 whatever buildings to 791 buildings were worth uh, uh, in real estate, something like $60 million plus around the right. Let's keep in mind, Yayo made $36 million in one year using the same buildings. Part of the argument of Bronx 2000 was that the danger is that they're going to diminish the tax base because the drug work entering these buildings is going to make it such that people move out, that landlords disinvest. And the biggest issue here when we draw the line, follow the road, is that we'll have less taxes. And so this form of informal work, at least, which in many ways seems extremely formal to me, it's just illicit, um, is seen as damaging the tax base and, and, and butting up against the work, again, of like, neighborhood laundromats, bodegas, restaurants, et cetera, that are paying into the system in a way that these folks aren't, I would say. Thank you, Aaron. Aaron? Right? Yeah, Aaron. Thanks for reading my other chapter, too. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes? We've got one right here, I think. Oh. And, and, and then um, This is also kind of a contemporary question. Uh, I know there's movements in a lot of different cities to um create safe use spaces yeah and i was curious um with your work on like spatial um, history and spatial socio history like if there were any historical context through the eyes of like these different drug capitalists to create safe use spaces yeah. in order to you know protect i guess the consumers in some way like i, I guess you could think of it that way or um if you could comment a little bit on looking at this history and how it could impact sort of the way that we look at space and like someone's right to a city or space yeah Wait one second. Um, there, are, there are a couple of things. That's a great question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm constantly pulled for the contemporary moment, given everything that's going on. I will point to two examples. In Washington Heights, there are safe space uses for other kinds of drugs, particularly clinics. And this is something that we're seeing all over the country, little by little. But uh, 
relatedly, something that we see that's kind of a perverse, bizarre, is cities allowing certain spaces to become centers of drug use. So one place that we see this, and maybe the capital in the United States is Kensington in Philadelphia, in North Philadelphia, where uh, the state has decided to retract itself. The cops are still there, but they're letting everything happen and containing it there as a way, maybe, maybe towards Aaron's point, to save the property and, and property tax revenues of the surrounding areas of Fishtown that's right next to it. Right? Um, so much of the history of how drug work is understood um, is through a kind of organic analogy of disease spreading. And so I think in some ways, this is the logic of a lot of uh, city leaders is if we are able to contain it, then it won't spread. Right? And so I think we're limited in so many of our solutions by that kind of language um, around disease and spread that attempts to kind of explain what's going on, but again, it's, it's quite limited in, in, in its capacity. So I would say that those are two places that we see maybe the more typical case that's maybe a more European style that we're starting to see in the US of safe spaces to shoot up and so on and so forth. Um, but then also the kind of bizarre way in which uh, different cities around the country are dealing with containing uh, particular areas of drugs and allowing it to flourish there in order to sacrificing those areas, one might say, to save other parts of the city that they see as revitalizing and, and, and revenue generating. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, this concludes our uh, live streaming, and we want to thank you once again. It's an honor to have you. We want to welcome you once again to Stanford into the class community. Um, and I want to uh, let everybody know, live stream, the who are in the live stream, that um, we, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have Professor Jonathan Rosa. He will be speaking about Latinx languages and I think the young borders. So Don't miss know. it. He's amazing. <laughs> I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And this is the time that